Mm. Hello everyone, my name is Rabia. Hope you're all well. It's been a while since I've spoken to you all, addressed my wonderful YouTube community and you know answered a few questions and just updated you about everything that's been going on recently. Uh, it's been a while. I guess the first thing to say is I had an incredible time at the NAMM show. It was truly surreal for me personally, obviously because I launched my artist model, Music Man Sabre, and getting to see them hung up with a, a wall with my sort of name logo above it on a furry wall with a screen and just, it was, it was mind blowing to be honest, walking up to that and just being like, that's, that's insane. Completely blew my mind and the response was amazing. Had a load of interviews with different uh, companies and publications and all that kind of stuff and everyone was really complimentary of the guitars and I just feel truly thankful that this is even a thing in my life. So yeah, thanks again to Music Man, to Brian, to everyone there for believing in me as an artist and wanting to do that. The guitars will be coming, uh, I think it's April, May time, sort of when they start getting rolled out into stores. So yeah, the, the Frenzied Flame Burst is limited to 30 pieces, whereas the Vile Blood model is going to be sort of a full production so you'll be able to find that. I bumped into a few different sort of YouTubers as well, people that you know make videos online about gear and so on and so forth and they said that that was one of the highlights for them so that's really really amazing so I'm just very thankful. So that's point number one, just wanted to say thank you. Point number two is Grinding Gears Volume 4 has had over half a million streams on Spotify alone in just over a month which it, it means it's probably the, the most popular volume so far, completely blown away by that. Um, just want to reassure you that tabs are coming. I'm in the process of sorting that out. Uh, it's taking a little while because there's a bit of a backlog, but it's going to happen. Point number three is my last single, Arrival, which coincided with the launch of my Music Man guitar. Uh, has been really well received. Um, not only that, people have praised the mix, which I feel very grateful for because, as I always say, I'm not really a mixing engineer, but it's something that I really enjoy. So it's great to see people are enjoying that tune. It's kind of my first foray into like a true lead guitar song all the way through where the focal point is the lead. I always knew that I wanted to do that kind of thing and that I could, but never really given it a proper go until uh, Arrival. So um, yeah, really thankful that people enjoy that tune. Links in the description box for the new music. So first update is about Vower. In case you didn't know, I have a new band, originals band called Vower. It involves myself, Rory McLean on bass, Joe Gosney and Liam Keeley, former members of Black Peaks, and Josh McKeown on vocals, who is also uh, the singer in Palm Reader. I'm just hugely excited and passionate about this project. We were in Middle Farm the back end of last year recording our first uh, EP, and happy to say I've got the masters back. It sounds incredible. Mark Roberts and myself mixed it, uh, produced it with each other, and I'm just very, very happy with the result. That is gonna be coming soon. We just shot a music video for the first single. The reason that there might be a little bit of a wait is because we're currently in the process of setting up a team. By team, I mean management, booking, PR, all that kind of stuff, because you wanna make sure that your team is ready to go when you, when you release this into the world. So just watch this space, because it's gonna start picking up pace. We have an Instagram page, as I've mentioned before. There is nothing on there right now, but if you wanna keep up to date with everything that's going on, there is a mailing list. All that information will be fed to Vower Band, which is on Instagram. It's also important to mention that we have some festival gigs this year. There'll be proper announcements coming, but I can guarantee you that the festivals that we're playing at are awesome. We've got Arc Tangent 2000 Trees, Radar Festival, and potentially Euroblast. But you know, that's just a quick sneak peek of information just there. We'll be announcing that officially soon. Next bit of information is very, very soon, probably within the next week or two, I will be launching something very exciting coming. It's been a long time in the making once again, uh, but it's gonna be very cool. Can't say what it is just yet, so I don't know how much of a piece of news that is, but I have a single that coincides with it. It's called Path of the Nomadic Ones, and it's cool, it's different. And happy to say that on this particular single, I actually played the drums in uh, on my kit downstairs because usually I play on the electric kit, tighten it up in Logic, and then, you know, program in stuff that's more technical. But this time I wanted to play the drums for real uh, on, a, on a single. So I actually recorded myself playing. So obviously there's drums, bass, guitar, layers, all that kind of stuff going on. But it was nice to do a tune where I feel like it's the full sort of 
one man band thing or whatever you want to call it. It's just a nice challenge to set upon yourself and do something different. So uh, yeah, that will be coming very soon and I'll be announcing that, you know, obviously on my YouTube community page and of course on social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, all the rest of it. If you don't follow me on those platforms, it's Rubia Afro in the description box below. Next update that I'm really excited about, in case some of you have noticed, I'm wearing a cool t-shirt. This is the latest t-shirt from Sleepless Apparel, which is my merch thing. Rather than it being Rabia merch, I wanted to do my own thing called Sleepless Apparel that I do with my friend Dan. So this, in case you're wondering, is Edgar Allan Poe. Now, I've had a t-shirt that I've been a massive fan of wearing. It's pretty much fallen to bits now. I've had it for years. I used it in, there's plenty of music videos like Terror Mist and there's you know, different gigs with Tosca and stuff over the years. It is one of my favorite t-shirts, but it's pretty much fallen to pieces and I can't find another one. I can't find it anywhere. So I wanted to do my own version of this t-shirt. Wonderful family friend, Alex Drury, did the design for me. She's based out in Oregon and she's incredible and she did this design and it's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. Roughly inspired by that old Poe t-shirt I wore but with a different spin. And I just think it looks sick. So if you want this t-shirt, go to sleeplessapparel.co.uk. I will link it in the description box below. But this is a sick t-shirt. It's probably my favorite t-shirt we've done so far. The next few bits of information are also very exciting. More traveling this year with Neural DSP. Uh, of course, some of you know that I work really close with Neural DSP. Some of my best friends work at the company. Uh, also, I have uh, Archetype Plugin with Neural DSP, in case you didn't know, even though I mention it like all the time. Uh, but yes, uh, we're gonna be doing some traveling. So the first bit of traveling uh, that I'm very excited about is going to Dubai. I'm going to Dubai uh, from March 4th to March 10th to do some workshops with Max and Neural DSP, of course. And the reason that I'm excited about going to Dubai is because it was where my parents met. So it has a bit of a special place in my heart for the fact that, you know, my parents met there, they fell in love, got married, had me, had my sister, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's just very cool that I get to go to the place where that all started. Um, and obviously, you know, it's in somewhere I've never been before and I think that, you know, it's a pretty exciting place to explore for the first time. Next bit of exciting traveling happens later in the year, but I'm going back to the Far East, which is an amazing thing because I love it there. I'm going back to South Korea uh, to see Musicians Club. I'm going to Japan. I believe we're also doing uh, Singapore and Thailand, I believe. Um, so I'm very excited because I love the Far East. I'm a huge fan of South Korea and Japan. I've been there a couple of times and I absolutely love it there. So I'm very excited to go back. That is once again with Neural DSP. So it's gonna be quite an exciting trip. That's kind of all the news for now. I'll update you with more exciting things as they come if you're interested. I appreciate all those who are interested. But on my community page on YouTube, I posted uh, that it's been a little while since I did like a Q&A thing. So I wanted to answer a few questions if anyone had any, just to you know connect and engage with you guys because you're all so awesome and I love connecting with everybody that supports what I do. We'll start with the first question from Guitar Hero Trey. He said, what pedal switcher do you use, if any? Give me about five that you would recommend. Well, I don't know about five, but the one that I use is the Gig Rig G3. I used to have a Gig Rig G2, now I use the G3, and they're amazing. It allows you to patch in all your pedals, program MIDI, so you can basically create a modular multi-effect in that sense that you can have presets, dial in different pedals, patch them in and all that stuff. Um, so I would definitely recommend Gig Rig uh, as my first choice. But I also use, or have used in the past, the Boss ES8, which is really cool. Joe from Vower uses the ES8, which is a fantastic switcher. Very much the same sort of thing. Has a few different functionalities uh, that are different, that make it its own thing compared to something like the Gig Rig. They also do, I believe it's the ES5, so it's a smaller version. And then they do something called the MS3, which is what Dave in Tosca used to use, which is a very small loop switcher, but it has built-in effects and all sorts of stuff as well. So it's a bit of a do-all kind of thing. Any of those will definitely work. It depends how big and expansive you want your pedal board to be. Of course, you can use something like a Korg Cortex as well, because that's what I'm gonna be doing with Vower. It allows me to switch in and out different preamps to my amplifier, switch in different pedals, control things with MIDI. I don't know if that necessarily counts as a switcher. It's not, it's a modeler, multi-effects thing, but you could use it in that way as well. Next question is from Robin Desmet 4672 Hey, first, congrats for your work. Thank you very much. What happened to the second song you recorded with Ben Meinl? So that song, While We Wait, it's finished. It's just 
Ben's a father of three, soon to be four. He's got a full-time working business that he runs himself. I obviously have all sorts of stuff going on. So although we finished the song, we haven't actually had time to shoot a video for it, which seems really stupid. To get us both in the same place, to be able to shoot a video has been very difficult. Could just put it on streaming platforms, but I always like to do something like that with a video, particularly because with Ben, we've got a big history there and it's fun to do that kind of thing, and make a bit more of a big deal about it like we did uh, before with the song Nomads. But it will happen, it's called While We Wait, and of course I will let you know when it's coming uh, onto streaming platforms and when the music video is finished and ready to go on YouTube. Next question is from Smokey Mac. It says, what inspires you? It's a very broad question. What inspires me could be a number of things, whether it's a film, a, uh, a place, a video game, another artist. It could be anything really. I tend to find that when I get most inspired is by film music still, because I feel like it really connects when the scene's right and the music sets in and it really makes you feel something. But also places, like when I've traveled and I've been in some really amazing places, that also gets the juices flowing. Although listening to other music uh, and other artists is helpful to sort of reference your inspiration, I'd say. It's one of those things that the less I listen to other artists, bands and guitarists or whatever, the more ideas I conjure up on my own. And I don't know if you guys find this as well, but if I don't listen to music, I let it allows me to just think of my own music in my head that I want to create, if that makes sense, because it's not filled up with other stuff. However, it's important to I guess find time to listen to some music to build new reference points and new ideas and such, but then to give yourself the time and the headspace so that you can just think of your own thing. What else inspires me is, you know, working with other people. Like in Vower, we've been able to churn out music. We've got an album written on top of this EP because Joe and I will sit in here, throw around a couple of ideas and you start bouncing off each other and that's inspiring. So working with other artists as well is also a great way to get inspired. Next question is from Day Slain and they ask, how do you approach layers, complementary guitar parts in your songs, bands? I love this question because it's something that I really love to do uh, and I feel like I really started to do more of this with the Totemist. Uh, something that I remember thinking to myself, which in hindsight I wish I hadn't really enforced that so much on myself and the band, was in Tosca. We were like, we only want to like be able to, we want to be able to recreate this sound perfectly live. So it means if you add too many layers and too many things, you can't physically play them. They're on track and then suddenly, I, I used to think that that was a negative thing. And to an extent, I still kind of do if it's mostly on track, uh, which is why gigging something like the Totemist has always been something I've shied away from because it's just me and Liam. It means bass and all the other layers are on track and I feel like that's more track than it is band. However, I love approaching layers and the reason that I brought up Totemist is because it was just me and Liam. So I had to play in bass and then I had to fill out this space with other cool stuff because it's instrumental. So you start to think of like top lines, not only do you think of little top line melodies to go over sections, but you also think what kind of sound would work for that. So you start to get a bit more of a producer hat on, jump into uh, your session and start dialing in specific tones that fill out a certain area in the arrangement that you can pick out when you're listening on headphones or whatever. Um, and that's a really fun thing to do. It's like painting. It's like you've done your broad strokes and then you start adding the little details, different colors, different ideas, different layerings through things like synth where I use my Moog's uh, Sub 37, or now I use the plugin to do that. Um, things like, you know, shoegaze style guitar, delay and reverb in front of the amp so it fills up and cascades. That could be a nice bed. It's, it's more just about thinking of other instrumentation that you can add to the arrangement. Not overdo it, it's just sprinkles over sections. Like if you've got a wall of sound chord, you know, sound, uh, section that doubles up it's like you know 16 32 bars long or whatever it is it might feel like it's drying up by the time you get to that halfway point and then you've got another full section of it well at that point you can bring in something else whether it's an arpeggio a layer over the top just sprinkles little twinkly sounds whatever just you know give yourself a bit of perspective from the main core instrumentation in my case guitar bass drums I'll sit back and listen to it and go, right, well, that sounds nice and powerful. I'm happy with where that is. But now I want to add, you know, this little top line here. 
that might be referenced later on in the song. You know, it might just be a very simple part and I'm letting more of the effects take the, the heavy lifting, like a really thick delay. So I really literally play a couple of notes and then it just keeps ringing out over the top and creates, you know, opposing rhythms and stuff like that. Really, just get your painter hat on, your producer hat, and just start like dabbling and seeing what fits and what, what elevates the arrangement in the right moment. Next question is from Philip9050. And he asks, are there any classical composers who have been influential in your songwriting? Would you consider doing an arrangement of a classical piece like LTE did on their last album? Enjoying the last, the latest installment of Grinding Gears, all the best. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of classical composers, really, um, it would have to be Gustav Holst, and which did, he did the planets. And then I would say, you know, more contemporary would be like Hans Zimmer which loads of people obviously love, and Thomas Newman as well, which is more film score stuff. But I find that particularly Gustav Holst, that, that body of work, it just pulls in so many different themes and, and moods and tension and release and emotion and all these different elements just keep coming in and out. And I feel like there's enough information in that stuff to fuel inspiration for the rest of my life. And it's also worth saying like the score for Bloodborne which is my favorite PlayStation game of all time and space. Uh, if you listen to the soundtrack for Bloodborne, that is outstanding. Like Ludwig, the Holy, um, Ludwig the, is it the Holy Blade? I forget the name, but the boss is called Ludwig. Ludwig's theme is insane. Father Gascoigne's theme is insane. There are some really epic moments throughout that whole score. If I can even take 0.5% of the musicality from these people and these, these, these bodies of work, and apply it to my own music, I would be very happy. Next question is from White House Studios, and they ask, could you walk us through or talk a bit about the absolutely savage bass patch you made to pair with your Warwicks, especially for those of us not on the QC? Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> It is absolutely savage. I feel like I lucked out by making this bass patch. For all those that don't know, I've released a couple of bass patches on QC uh, that I've used exclusively since the first Totemus record and I still use them today. All the Vawa stuff are modified versions of those because I just feel like somehow I grabbed the perfect combination of different things. But in terms of what they are, it's a dual amp rig, so it's a Thunderverb and a Microtubes uh, bass amp running into two different cabs. I think it's an F SVT 8x10 cab and then it would be a dark glass cab. But on top of that, in front I have compression and then after compression I've got the, the microtubes pedal, the vintage microtubes pedal. And you know, that's all fairly modern gear, but the way in which that they're dialed in and they complement each other allows for this brutal sounding bass. It really sounds sick. I've used it all over the place now. There is also an EQ block in there to, you know, tune out some of the stuff you don't want and add things you do want. But generally speaking, the combination of the Thunderverb and the Microtube's head into cabs, I think that is where that blend is. And then powered by that microtubes pill in front, the vintage one, that is the golden combination there that has allowed for everything from the filthiest, disgusting tones to the softer, nice stuff. You just turn the blend down and then the amps clean up and you know it's more dynamic. There is also a Soviet fuzz patch that I threw in there as well. It's basically just absolute grimace inducing, disgusting bass tone. But yeah, if you're on QC, that patch is on my profile, so you can uh, download it for yourself and have a go. But I believe that it works best with the Warwicks because I, that's the basses I use. I use a Warwick Corvette and a Warwick Thumb NT5, and those basses, I feel like it really works with those. I'm not, I don't have experience in other basses, um, haven't tried it with other basses, but sounds pretty filthy. Next question is from Dylan Lloyd. 23 and he says bro your mixes have been fire emoji recently thank you very much what would you say has contributed most to achieving the results you have with your recent mixes also was there a moment when things just clicked for you when it came to mixing great question thank you for asking i'll start at the back end of the question where did things feel like they clicked for me with mixing that would be 
the first Total Miss record. What we had was a great drum recording uh, that we did at Brighton Electric, and we had scratch guitar. So I, what I took home was just a drum recording, and I had to redo the guitar, track the bass, add the layers. Maybe it was because that I was working as a producer at the same time as engineering this thing, and then on top of that, knowing what I kind of wanted it to build into as the final thing. I remember thinking, I'm getting the hang of this a bit more. I'm understanding EQ and compression, and that chain and how it works with your master bus chain and just sort of automation as well. Like I started to understand more about these processes that happen on every mix session that contribute to the final picture. And it really clicked for me during that time. It's generally a lot of EQ and compression in multiple stages till you get to the final thing. There are other tricks you can do, but I think that particularly for rock and modern rock and heavy metal and stuff, it's a lot of that. It's carving out frequencies, EQing and compressing and getting things to glue and sound powerful at the final stage. More recently, what do I think has contributed to my mixing outside of the experience of doing a bit more of it and working with more real drums and stuff? Being completely honest, and again, this might sound like a plug, but it's not. It's working with these Genelex. Like in the last couple of months, having this, this Genelex system has just catapulted me forward again having a sub the rooms treated better and just the sound of those monitors everything became clearer I could hear what the low end was doing more accurately and everything just sort of became a bit easier because I've got more clarity to listen they're called the Genelec the ones monitors uh, and the sub and the route it's tuned to the room and it's just insane the quality here's a question from Jake Trubisky 3960 and he asks Quad Cortex versus Fractal. Quad Cortex. The penultimate question is from Zach Boyce Music, and he asks, what is your secret to adding so much groove to your riffs? Even without drums, everything bounces. Thank you very much. I think it's because I started drumming first, and if I'm sat on my own playing, I'm thinking uh, like there's a drummer there. Like I'm always grooving to a groove in my head. It's not like I'm actively thinking about the intricacies of the groove, but if I'm playing a riff, there is a groove there, you know? Like there's gonna be a drummer playing along in my brain uh, subconsciously that allows me to try and sit in a pocket. There are other really important factors, but timing and rhythm, for me, are really important because it allows you to lock in with other musicians, it allows you to have that groove you're talking about. And, you know, learning from people like Nuna, who also started on drums and is hugely into his rhythm, you know, just, it's always been in my mind since I started playing guitar has drums, groove, rhythm, that kind of thing. I'm not standing there saying I'm the grooviest player ever, but like it's been hugely helpful to me to be able to groove along and play and, and come up with cool riffs that always, like you say, feel like they bounce a bit. Cause it's not, to me, I want it to feel like it bounces to me, like I'm grooving along. I want it to, I want to feel the groove, even if I'm only playing on my own, you know? so. I think it's just ingrained to do that. But if it's something you want to improve on, play along to drum loops, play along to a metronome and try and feel that pocket. And then once you've done that for long enough, then you just take that away and just see if you can make it groove on your own. Record yourself, listen back. Is it making you bop? You know, that kind of thing. So yeah, anyway, I appreciate the question. Last question is coming from William Bratton, 2010. And he asks, will you be putting out a signature set for a Telecaster through bare knuckle pickups? Right, that's all the questions for this one. Maybe I won't leave it so long until the next one. It's been quite an in-depth video update thing, but I just wanna say I love you all. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you for the questions. There are tons more questions, so I might do another Q&A. If you have any more questions you'd like to ask me, put them in the comment section below. It could be about anything. I, I love to connect with you all and talk and you know, keep this thing going. So yeah, thank you. Uh, but yeah, hope you've found some of this information exciting. Hope some of those answers to those questions were helpful. Thank you for watching this video. Let's do another Q&A soon. Keep your eyes and ears open for new stuff that's coming very soon. I'll be announcing it on all my social media platforms. Thank you all for watching this video. I've been Rubia and I will see you all very soon.